Greetings, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Dr. Martha Grogan, a cardiologist at the Mayo Clinic. And during today's roundtable review, we'll be discussing remote monitoring for the management of heart failure. I'm joined today by my colleague, Dr. Margaret Redfield, who's the director of the Circulatory Failure Program at Mayo Clinic, and Jean Wagner, who's a nurse practitioner who's an expert in the management of patients with heart failure and those who have had heart uh, transplant, and Carolyn Devins, who's our nurse uh, uh, coordinator RN in the Heart Failure Clinic. So let's get started. Maggie, what is CardioMEMS? Well, uh, this is about remote monitoring of heart failure, and CardioMEMS is a type of remote monitoring for heart failure uh, system. Uh, what it is is a tiny little pressure transducer that's placed in the pulmonary artery during a right heart catheterization. The patient uh, transmits a reading from this pressure sensor every day, and that goes to a website that contains a lot of information uh, for the providers to review, and they see the pulmonary artery pressures and uh, make treatment adjustments according to those pressure readings. It's pretty amazing when you think of this technology, you know, that used to be available only in the intensive care unit now implanted in, in, in patients. Um, why do we use it? What, you know, why is it helpful? Well, you know, we manage uh, a lot, our team manages a lot of heart failure patients. And over the years, uh, we've looked for a remote monitoring system that was proven. Uh, and this is the first remote monitoring system that's actually been proven in a clinical trial uh, to improve outcomes, a large multi-center randomized controlled trial. Uh, we looked at the scales uh, systems mm. where you transmit a weight yes. and some questions, uh, but never really proven in a big trial, actually, and there were two relatively large trials that didn't show a benefit. Uh, we were interested in the thoracic impedance monitoring, but again, no mm -hmm. trial to show it worked, and a minority of our patients actually have those devices. So we were quite excited uh, when the CHAMPION trial showed that using the CardioMEM system dramatically uh, reduced heart failure admissions in patients with chronic heart failure of either type, systolic or diastolic heart failure. So that's really why we have adopted this at Mayo. And it's great because reducing admissions and readmissions are so important um, overall in the care of patients with exactly. heart failure. So that's really uh, uh, crucial. And that brings us to, is CardioMEMS, is that reimbursed by payers or what, what happens with the um, financial issues? Absolutely, it is FDA approved and uh, CMS uh, has uh, delegated funds to cover it. So it's, it's well reimbursed by Medicare and most insurance providers. Now it's a new device and it takes a little bit of uh, groundwork uh, to get that all set up at your institution. But yes, it is reimbursed not only for the device, but the implantation procedure and then actually the remote monitoring over time is reimbursed as well. Great, so very important. Um, uh, Jean, what, what kind of uh, patients are a good candidate for CardioMEMS? You see so many heart failure patients over the years, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're excited to have some, some new options for monitoring them. Yes, Who definitely. Who should we think about this for? Oh, so typically, um, these are designed for people that are the frequent flyers in the hospital. Um, the, the FDA approval is for patients who, are, who have substantial class three heart failure symptoms. Doesn't matter if it's systolic heart failure or reduced or preserved ejection fraction heart failure, but they have substantial symptoms and recurrent hospitalizations within the last year. Um, what I found is the most, um, where it seems to work the best in, is in those patients with difficult exams. For instance, they have a short squat neck and it's difficult to look at JVP or someone who has obesity and it's difficult to look at um, exam parameters. I also think it's pretty helpful in those patients with multimorbidities. So if someone has severe COPD, um, obesity, and heart failure, is this dyspnea really fluid overload? And that's where the CardioMEMS can really make a difference. Right, I, I echo that completely. And one important note is you do have to have at least one heart failure hospitalization in the last 12 months to meet the FDA mm. indication. And if you're in the hospital and seeing a patient with 
their first heart failure hospitalization in the last 12 months, th that doesn't count. You, you can't implant it during that hospitalization. It can't be your very first time that you've been hospitalized for heart failure? In, in a 12-month oh, period. Okay. okay, so if you see someone, maybe they were hospitalized two years ago, they're now re-hospitalized. Um, you can't implant the device during that hospitalization. Mm -hmm. Now, if you see the patient subsequently, and you know, you've know tr you tried to adjust their therapies mm -hmm. and they're still class three, then subsequently you can implant it. Then they don't have to be in the hospital again. No. No, okay. Because so they've already had that one, one hospitalization, hospitalization in the last 12 months. Okay, got it. Yeah, so that's important to know what yes. the criteria are for yeah. implanting uh, those. And how about, Jean, um, what kind of patients maybe are not good candidates for this, this type of monitoring? That's a great question. I think it's, um, you need to be able to do something with the data. So if you have a patient with, say, fixed pulmonary hypertension and renal failure and they're diuretic resistant, um, learning what their PA pressures isn't really going to help you because you don't have anything to do with that information. You can't augment their diuretics or vasodilate them. So you have to have a patient who has some response to diuretics. So somebody with end-stage renal failure, for instance, mm -hmm. wouldn't be an appropriate mm -hmm. candidate. Somebody, they have to have some room to move exactly on their right. medical management, otherwise right. no reason to have the device. Right. Right, okay, that's great. Um, and how about, Maggie, how, how does a person go about starting a CardioMEMS remote monitoring system? I, I, you know, I, I know that when we've had some of these systems before, just the sheer volume of data can be overwhelming, but how does a group get involved in setting this up? Right, and before I answer that, I want to add one thing to uh, Jean's comment is that quite often we'll get asked, well, I have this patient who doesn't come to their appointment, doesn't take their medicines, uh, you know, I can't get a hold of them on the phone. Extremely non-compliant patients. They're also not good candidates because they have to be willing to do this little two-minute uh, procedure in the morning mm -hmm. where they transmit mm -hmm. the data, and then they've got to be willing to take a phone call and, and work with you. So I think that's another kind of patient who's, who's not a good candidate. As far as getting started at an institution, um, you really have to have someone who's sort of going to be the champion for this. Now, a lot of us heart failure uh, providers uh, are not really used to dealing with devices. So the first thing I did when setting up our uh, program was talk to my colleagues in Heart Rhythm and the cath lab. Mm -hmm. They're very used to this, you know, having a new device right. and, you know, getting the coding people and the financial people mm -hmm. and uh, negotiating the contract. And so they were very helpful in, in getting that set up. Um, we did meet with our coders because when you implant the device in a patient in the hospital, they get a, a different DRG. It's not just the heart oh. failure DRG. Mm -hmm. So the coders needed to understand that. And then they also needed to make sure they were using the right procedure codes or CPT codes. Um, so that's kind of the first step. And then you have to build your team. And uh, what you're seeing here today, we have three other nurses besides Carolyn are all involved and two other nurse practitioners in our heart failure clinic and obviously several other physicians. So you have to get the team on board. Everyone has to be educated in how to use the system. Um, and uh, how to make sure that the patients are well informed uh, to educate the patients, um, and how you're going to manage it in the in the day to day uh, practice. Uh, so, and then you have to get implanters, uh, you know, people who are expert in implanting the devices. And uh, we have three different providers. Uh, two of them are heart failure physicians who also do a hemodynamic cath, and one's an interventional cardiologist. So you have to get them on board and get them ed educated, and they have to have three proctored implants mm -hmm. per, per provider as the first operator uh, prior to uh, being able to implant them. And then we worked very carefully with our cath lab, so they maintain the supply of the uh, systems um, and uh, uh, get them integrated into uh, the team so that everything goes very smoothly when you schedule a patient. They have the device, the cath lab, people are all familiar with it, um, the implanter's familiar, uh, and then the team is ready to take mm -hmm. over after implantation. 
Perfect. So you had to do a lot of background work to get yeah. it set up. Yeah. Uh, once a person becomes up to speed for the implanter, how long does the implant take? Um, usually not very long. It's just a right heart calf. It's through ephemeral access. Um, and uh, the patient has to be off anticoagulation for that. Um, and then they just go into the descending pulmonary artery, take some readings, implant the device, uh, put the uh, catheter back right above the device, take some more readings, and that calibrates the device mm -hmm. on the system. Uh, and that's it. So that's pretty pretty quick. Yeah. Uh, as far as for the patient, it's yes. not a, it's not a long no. procedure for them. No. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, and um, so you've really kind of told us about a lot of the systems that you put in in place to really facilitate the the use of this. And how about documentation, Carol? And, and and that would be one thing I'd wonder about. I mean, mm -hmm. right, you know, what kind of volume of data do you get, and how do you document what you get from the device? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's something that um, we may need to do on a day-to-day -day basis, depending on the changes that occur. We can um, incorporate those changes in the website itself, the Merlin.net website, and then we will make comments in the medical record as well. Okay, so um, not a huge burden of documentation because no. some of, a lot of it's automated, is that right? Exactly, yeah. and, we, okay. and you know, we can make it as brief as we want. Um, for those notes in the website, and, okay. and we, you know, we can come up with shorthand for the medical record to make it very quick and easy. So, okay, yeah. great. Yeah, they have a, a shorthand system. Yeah. yeah, and how about you know any of you if you want to just chime in about patient experiences with this device? What 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 have you um, um, heard from patients about the device? Well, um, before we go that, I just wanted to mention a couple extra things that actually Carolyn has been very um, instrumental in setting up for our workflow uh, thing. Um, we've done a few things we, within our EMR. Uh, we've set up a CardioMEMS hot list, so all our patients who have devices oh, are just a one easy mm -hmm. place to go, uh, and you can pull them up real fast in our EMR mm -hmm. as you kind of remind yourself about that patient. Um, they've also made a CardioMEMS email distribution list uh, and a CardioMEMS checklist. So we can just type in on our system intranet CardioMEMS and it takes us to this document and it just has some reminders about mm, what needs great. to be done for mm -hmm. implant mm -hmm. uh, and we quickly fill that out and then we email that on a distribution list which includes all the nurses who are going to be managing the patients um, the implanters, the cath lab. So everybody on the team is kept the in the team loop. And the coders Perfect. so that mm -hmm. they know that patient. Mm -hmm. So um, that's been uh, very helpful for us. And then we have uh, CardioMEMS Tuesdays uh, when uh, CardioMEMS Tuesdays. Yes. Oh, okay. Taco Tuesdays. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Carolyn and the other nurses and whichever provider is mm -hmm. managing the patients. Um, correspond either virtually via email or phone or in person and just kind of run the list of our patients and see if anything needs to be done. You know, you monitor the patients um, quite closely early after implant, mm -hmm. but then uh, less closely, you know, maybe once or twice a week after that. So that's kind of built into our workflow. In addition, as the provider that's caring for that patient, if the patient's parameters are outside of a preset um, goal, that number or that gets flagged and I get a message. So I know to look at that data. Right. That right. Okay. So then the patient experiences, um, um, maybe Jean wants to tell us or Carolyn about mm -hmm. some patient experiences with the device? Sure. Sure. Um, you know, I think that they, you know, a patient is of course going to appreciate um, the fact that they can save themselves a hospitalization. And uh, this is a pretty, you know, it's invasive initially just to put the, put the device in. But, you know, afterward, it's, it's so quick and easy for them, you know, daily, these daily transmissions. And, um, you know, they just need to know that, you know, they still need to call with changes in their mm -hmm. clinical condition. And so we need to make that known up front that, mm -hmm. you know, the responsibility still lies with them to, to notify us. Mm -hmm. you know, we can see the numbers. from their standpoint. And Jean, mm -hmm. patients, what feedback have they given you? Um, I, I, one patient in particular um, had heard repeatedly, there's nothing we can do for you. There's, mm -hmm. nothing, there's nothing further to revascularize. Um, we can't transplant you. There's nothing further we can do. And 
this provided him a sense of security that at least there's somebody watching out for him. Um, at the same time, he also had the perception that this meant it was going to help his heart failure. And so when I call whenever his PAs are so high, he goes, darn it, you know exactly when I'm cheating oh. on my sodium <laughs> before I even get symptoms. <laughs> so it, it's an interesting thing that patients experience. I, I'm wondering who was monitoring the day after Thanksgiving? Was that kind of <laughs> a yes. challenge? Yeah. Was, yeah. Uh, did you it get a busy. lot of high alerts? I mean, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't know. And Maggie, how about disseminating this kind of throughout the whole Mayo heart failure practice? I mean, obviously we have a heart failure clinic, but getting more widely involved. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, it's a new thing. And you know, as with beta blockers way back when and left ventricular assist devices, CRT, all these advances in heart failure management, there's a learning curve and, uh, oh, am I going to think of this mm -hmm. curve? So all our providers have been educated and uh, so they refer us patients and, and people are increasingly thinking about it. But from a healthcare system uh, perspective, if you really want this to decrease right. the total number of heart failure hospitalizations uh, within your system, you really have to be somewhat systematic about it. So to augment that, we've started doing some screening of patients who uh, have had a heart failure hospitalization in the last year. Uh, we review their record and then if they look like they're appropriate, uh, we contact their provider and discuss cardiomems. Uh, so we're really starting to do that on a Have systematic basis. Have they been kind of basis. surprised? I imagine maybe if you call some of these, you know, uh, general practitioners or primary care providers, are they a little surprised where you say, gosh, I've got basically this PA catheter yeah. that we could put in your patient? Or what's the reaction been? Usually it's just, oh, that's so cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, that's great. And I think everybody recognizes, as Jean uh, commented on, you know, these, not many of our patients just have heart failure. Right, and right. It's just so useful when you don't know if the shortness of breath is, you know, the lung disease they have mm -hmm. or the heart failure. I think that would be a really important population. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I, I uh, would echo Carolyn's comments. It's um, a very uh, reassuring thing for patients. They, they really feel that closeness, and yet it's not too... Um, imposing on their day-to-day -day lifestyle. So that's really been well accepted and uh, nearly all our patients have been incredibly compliant. So it's good, been a good. very positive experience. Anything else to add from anybody um, that we haven't touched on? I think we've kind of covered the spectrum probably. I would just say I find this so exciting. I mean, and I think, I think we're gonna learn so much about heart failure. And I think there's a lot of things other than avoiding hospitalizations mm -hmm. that'll be studied in the future. I mean, what does better management of the PA pressures do for the patient's right ventricle, which as mm -hmm. we know is so critical and prognosis and how they're doing clinically. So I, I feel like kind of we're at the dawn of a new era. Uh, it's exciting here. because there really haven't been that many big advances in heart failure and certainly technology like this, not something that we've ever had in the outpatient setting before. Yes, for, for right. the day-to-day -day management, right. right. We haven't had any, we've had lots of therapeutic adva uh, had. advances, but in just the day-to-day -day management. Right. Uh, right. I, I mean, really takes it into a different paradigm yes. and, and, and blocks that cycle, hopefully, of the readmissions, but as you say, learn a lot of other important information about heart failure. Absolutely. That's great, great. Well, thank you very much for sharing your important insights about this uh, device. Uh, and thanks to our viewers for tuning in today uh, to this Mayo Clinic Roundtable Review at theheart.org on Medscape.